Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, just um, like to say hello. I'm just hoping that the slide will also appear on the screen down the front, maybe, so I can see what slide I'm on. Um, or maybe it won't. Okay, I'll stand to one side. Anyway, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm here from JISC. JISC is the organization that runs the UK Research and Education Network called Janet. Um, ah. Janet is uh, a network that covers the whole of the UK, Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Um, doesn't go into Wales so much. There's a, um, a public service network that connects um, universities and colleges in Wales and that in turn connects into Janet, the same with Kent for historical reasons. Um, the, the network we run has a backbone with about 10 major pops on it. Um, the fattest part of the backbone runs at 800 gig. Um, some parts are uh, only 200, but they're constantly upgraded to, to meet requirements. Um, we have about nine kilometers, no, nine kilometers, 9,000 kilometers of fiber and about 1,000 um, customers that, that we connect. So it's, it's quite a large network, but it covers most, most of the UK. Um, we also have a lot of connectivity outside of, of Janet, of course. It would be no point just connecting the universities together themselves and colleges. Um, so we have a lot of private uh, connections to a number of content providers, as you can see here. Plus, we have commercial or commodity connections externally. And we have, importantly, the giant link here, connections to other research and education networks, the, the equivalents of Janet in other countries. So Renatair in France, for example, we'll hear a little bit about the French situation shortly. Um, it would be nice to, well, there, there is a, a success, there's a good news story as, as part of this. And the good news story is that we've had IPv6 on the Janet network for the best part of 20 years now. It runs dual stack with v4. Um, just the same as most of the other networks, RNE networks um, around the world do like us. Um, and IPv6 connectivity is made available directly to all our member organizations. If you connect to Janet, then the V6 capability comes as part of your standard IP connections. There's nothing extra an Insight has to do to have V6. Um, as you might expect, we offer a default slash 48 to sites as per the, the usual policy. Some universities have gone as big as a slash 44, where they've been able to justify that. A small number have gone the LIR path, so they get their own slash 29 slash 32, um, just as we do. Um, they've chosen to do that because they want and can justify the address space for the purposes that, that they have. Um, all our network services support v6, all the things you'd expect, DNS, NTP, etc. the edge roam peerings for our uh, Wi-Fi roaming. Um, and our own web presence is enabled, not directly, but through a, through a CDN. So in principle, there should be, you know, we've got a good story to tell about the Janet network, the whole coverage, and v6 to the doorstop of every organization, every HE and FE, higher education, further education college, every research organization. So it should be good. Um, However, um, when you then drill down into the stats of actually how the adoption is, it's a bit of a different story. Um, so some of this information is thanks to Graham Bragg, who Veronica mentioned. He's one of the core council team members, and he gave a talk at our annual event, the, the JISC annual event, earlier in the year. He did some sort of rough investigation as best as he could. Um, so over, over 160 universities in the UK, Sort of good news is over 100 have a V6 assignment, so that shows some interest in V6. You have to proactively ask us for the assignment. We don't just give it to you. Um, unfortunately, though, only 26 of the 160 have evidence of V6 being seen somewhere. There's various ways you can count being seen. So only 26 have any form of V6 activity that, that Graham could um, observe from what he was doing. Um, and of the Times top 20 universities, so the ones you that expect to be good universities, all of those have an assignment. 14 of them have traffic scenes. So that's a much higher ratio than the universities overall. Um, 10 have um, IPv6 DNS. Five have their web uh, site enabled. Uh, and three, and the other important thing here is universities, you'd expect them when they're teaching to um, be including v6 on their syllabi, syllabuses. Um, and Graham could only find evidence of v6 being mentioned on three uh, of those organizations' computer science degree syllabuses. So it may simply be that they don't choose to mention it. It may be that they do teach it. 
but you'd hope that all those sort of organizations would do so. Um, so it's not a great story. Um, the, the one you know, little shining example that Dave will talk about later is the CERN experiment community or the, the UK grid PP sites, the particle physics sites. So there we have 19 of those in the UK taking part and 15 of those have V6 enabled on the part of their network where those grid PP systems and storage nodes are. So that's good news. And the other bit of good news is we did recently see, Imperial is, is one of those, we did see uh, where we give them 100 gig connectivity. They've managed to fill a 100 gig link with V6 traffic of data coming from CERN. So there's some good news. But overall, deployment isn't as, as great as we'd like it to be. Um, one of the things we do encourage sites that are doing large-scale data transfers to do, and it's, it's probably not something you'd see so much in the commercial networks, is if you've got a campus network infrastructure, is rather than putting your big fat file systems that are going to do that data exchange in behind your main campus firewall right inside your, your campus, is to put those systems at the edge of the network and have rather than having all that traffic go through the big fat stateful firewalls that do intrusion detection, all that sort of stuff, which isn't needed when you're just looking at CERN data, for example. Just have that off the edge of your campus through maybe some stateful filtering um, into your data transfer nodes that are doing, moving the data around. And that's a much more efficient way and a much more performant way of having those large-scale data transfers happen. When you're moving data around at very high speed or relatively high speed, um, you know, those stateful campus firewalls can struggle somewhat. We have evidence of you know, university sites where they might have quite high capacity to us, but they're essentially throttled if they try and do stateful firewalling. So one of the nice use cases we try and promote is to deploy IPv6 in what's known as this sort of science DMZ part of the network, on the edge where you're doing these big large-scale data transfers, put v6 on that part of your network, and allow the V6, the science traffic, to make use of V6. That's exactly what the grid PP people are doing. A um, little bit more, maybe more depressing news on the V6 usage stats for Janet. So a little bit more into the numbers. Obviously, as Veronica has shown, over 40% of the UK's user traffic uh, is V6. Um, from our point of view, our peering with Geant, so all the research and education traffic goes out um, over Jayant, apart from HEA net to Ireland, but everything else goes out through Jayant. 17% of the traffic going out to other r &E networks is V6, and 8% coming in. So um, not so bad, but it's still not close to the, uh, the UK average. And worse is that on the general commodity external traffic, so traffic from the Janet sites out to the commercial internet, only 2.5% of the traffic going out is V6 and only 1.6% coming in. That doesn't include those private connections I talked about earlier, but that's obviously a, a very, very small number. And if you look at the APNIC charts that Jeff Houston produces, um, the, the numbers for Janet have been going down there. They are now, they correlate that 2.5%. You see the figures for Janet down at 2.5%. Um, so, yeah, this is not what we would hope to see. Um, there's nothing we at GIST can do to force uh, our members to, to use V6, but we would certainly be hoping that research and education networks should be paving the way. They should be using V6 for research. Um, and certainly, they should be teaching V6 and have environments where students can experience it if they're coming out into an industry where half the traffic nearly or soon will be V6. Um, there's va there are various rationales that we try and promote to um, our members to encourage them to deploy V6. Many of those you'd have seen in previous talks I'd have given. I mean, the most important one is supporting teaching and research, as, as far as I would see for uh, an R&E site. Um, the fact that 40% of the internet traffic is V6, and at the current rate, that'll be half by 2024. It seems to be linear growth. So you would imagine you'd want to deploy it to be using the technology that the rest of the internet is using. Um, there's arguments certainly for robustness. I imagine this is why the big content providers have deployed V6. So if you've got V6 only clients accessing your content, if you make it available over V6, you'll make it native end to end and that should make it as performant and robust as possible. We're here, we'll hear in a little bit about um, some of the issues with um, carry grade now. We've got a panel on that, but you know, the, the V4 network is starting to get a little bit more fragile in the way it's deployed and more complex with address sharing, private address sharing, etc., and double layers of NAT. So avoiding that is good. Security, 
um, with their pretty much every platform having v6 support and it on by default usually you should, if you're deploying a campus network you should at least be aware of the the issues that may be in your network even if you think it's v4 only um, scalability and innovation you know, there's a there's a whole load of these things that universities i think should be thinking about but i would argue not enough of them are I mean, if there are other rationales and drivers, someone sitting in the audience thinking, wouldn't that be a good thing to promote? Uh, we're all ears, so if you've got any more ideas and suggestions for things that we can, angles we can push to try and encourage the universities to deploy, you know, please do shout. Uh, and then finally, what are we doing at JISC? Um, we're very keen to be uh, using V6, both internally and our public-facing services, and to encourage our member organizations to use it, the colleges and universities. Um, our network position is very good. As I explained on the first slide, everything's dual stack on the network. There's V6 right to the doorstep of every um, one of the universities and colleges on our network. Um, we don't, though, necessarily in JISC have everything we do V6 enabled yet, so we're having a fresh push now to make that happen. Um, the network part is, but there are a whole bunch of other services and things we provide as JISC to organizations. We want to make sure all of that is available over V6. Um, so there's a few things we're doing there. One is making sure internally we know what we mean by V6 support for when we're doing procurements, including things must work in the absence of V4, which I think is an important thing to be including there. So all of our new procurements now must have um, V6 uh, stated as a requirement in them. And anything we develop internally now for the project lifecycle management, you cannot get anything shouldn't be able to get anything to production um, without the V6 support being demonstrated in the service transition gate in that process. Um, the only exception, so we're focusing on, on new things, the only exception to that is in our security services, we're making sure that um, you know, V6 is considered in everything we do in the security point of view, because that's really important. And for the members, we're providing, as you might expect, advice and guidance, technical guides, etc. You can look at some of those. Um, there's the links there. So I think that's it. Yeah, so I think in summary, Janet is in a good position from the point of view of um, the way our network is configured and run and the support within the network, but the adoption is nowhere near the levels that we would hope it to be and nowhere near the levels of the commercial internet in, in the UK. Um, and the data that Graham dug out reinforces that. And if, you know, if the universities and colleges aren't deploying, that is going to have an effect on industry. The, you know, the graduates that come out aren't going to necessarily be taught about it or have the experience, and that, that can't be a good thing. Um, there are some encouraging exceptions, but there's clearly more to be done. So if you've got any ideas, suggestions, uh, there's probably not time for questions now, but do catch me in a coffee break or over lunch. I'll be very happy to talk to you. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>